to serve as the Secretary of Board Directors of NARI. So if you have any questions, you can ask uh, Steve over here or me. We uh, think most of our board members are here, and we're happy to answer your questions. I'm going to pass around the sign-in sheet. This is the only way you get credit for this course today, so please make sure you pull that out. Put your CCB number on there before you leave. I'd like to start off by introducing Mr. Dirk Dieter. Mr. Dieter is the founder and executive director of the Fremont Group. He has an undergraduate and a law degree from Michigan State University where he played baseball. In the 70s, he coached college baseball at Oakland University in Rochester Hills, Michigan while finishing his law degree. And then in 1981, he moved from Michigan to Denver, Colorado, and he started his own business there. In 1995, he began his management consulting firm as a senior business analogist an analyst for a major firm traveling to every state in the United States. In fact, he has actually been in over 5,000 businesses today. He developed consulting materials for business analysis and authored Minding My Own Business. And the profits from that book have all been donated uh, to his charity, the Fremont Group. Uh, he also developed Minding My Own Business workshops and is often a speaker at Chamber of Commerce and other organizations. Today, he's the executive director of the Fremont Group and works with an investment banking firm and other firms to provide debt and equity to appropriate small businesses. His mission is to bring the quality professional services to small businesses, uh, small businesses at affordable rates for their owners. So please let's have a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I would add is I must be really valued because you say the value of a consultant is you take what they know and multiply it from how far away they live from you. And since I came from 1,200 miles away, and I know a little bit, this is going to be really valuable. I also know that this is 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock, whatever it is in the afternoon, and you guys have been going at this all day long, and hey, thank you for even coming in here. Frankly, if I was you, I probably would have figured out how to find the door and move on somewhere else and, and try to get the credit. Um, I think it was pretty well uh, described there what we do. We're a nonprofit organization. We work with small businesses uh, across the nation. I've had clients in all 50 states of the United States three times and uh, in many of the provinces. Uh, one of our success partners is uh, Brent Lawrence, who was uh, the presenter next door here earlier. Uh, are you red, green, blue, or yellow? I'm, I, I'm uh, red, yellow. Red, yellow. Okay. Our judging talker. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not too yellow because I'll put you all to sleep. Uh, we, uh, you can find all the stuff about us. Uh, it was mentioned that the book profits are donated to our period. That's not correct. Uh, we are technically not a 501c3, but we do take any profit that we make as a nonprofit and donate to different uh, universities uh, around, particularly University of Colorado and some of the other ones uh, uh, that have business programs, entrepreneurial programs, things like that. Uh, we offer management consulting, outsourced accounting. If you have problems with your accounting, we can come in and just take it over and, and do it remotely. Uh, we have our website, tfginfo.org, that's got over 200 different articles on business management. I hope you go there. Uh, we also have a Patreon site. And we do my own, my own business workshops. Uh, the workshops and consulting we can do, we have separate workshops in consulting and leadership, organizational structure, Accountability incentives, budgeting, cash flow forecasting, transition ownership, sales, risk management, and many other ones. Uh, today what you're getting is the Minding My Own Business Workshop. We'll go through it a little bit quickly, frankly, because it's typically about a day and a half course. Uh, this Minding My Own Business Workshop uh, is also offered to Oregon landscape contractors for their continuing education credits. Uh, you go through the book, you have uh, interaction with a success partner, take quizzes and so on, and that is often also. Um, but first, since we got to get going here, we're going to have a little quiz. All right? Quiz time. Get out your piece of paper. Here it is. Three people walk into a hotel. They say, we want a room. And the desk clerk says, oh, sure, no problem, $30. So each of the guy pulls out 10 bucks, gives it to the desk clerk. Calls for the bellman, bellman takes the bags up to the room, and uh, the guys don't tip him. The bellman gets kind of upset about that. He walks back down to the front desk, and he says, uh, hey, eh, you know, I'm not too crazy about that. One of the clerk says, hold on a minute. I overcharged those guys. That room was only $25, so here's five $1 bills. Take that back up to these guys. Take it back up. So now he's walking up there, 
and he, like I said, he's a little upset, and uh, he thinks, you know, um, three people can't divide five dollars, so he puts two dollars in his pocket, and he gives one dollar back to each one of the guys. So, each one of the guys now paid nine dollars for the room, right Donna? Yes. Okay, three times nine is twenty-seven dollars. There's two dollars in his pocket. Where's the other dollar? I know it's late, guys. It's the wrong question. Bingo! It is the wrong <laughs> question. What can you get out of management consulting? What can you get out of working with professionals? They can't fix your business. They can't do different things for you. But they can give you the right tools so that you are asking the right questions. Because if you don't ask the right question, you're never going to get to the right answer. And so that's what we deal with all the time, is teaching people and giving them the tools so that they can be asking the right question. Only you can fix that business. What we want to accomplish today is we want to look at the six responsibilities of a small business owner. Each one of you has these six responsibilities. And as we go through this, evaluate yourself and evaluate your organization against each one of those responsibilities. Before we start, though, there's a bigger question. Why does your business exist at all? Why do you have a business? Andy, why do we have a business? What is it doing here? Okay? I mean, what is its purpose? We feel there is only one reason for that business to exist, and that is to make your life better. Period. Is your business making your life better, or is it making it worse? That's the underlying question. And if the only reason for it to make it better is let's look at some of the things that make it better. If you do have a pencil, or you can think about it yourself, do this. List at least three ways on the left side of your paper that your business is making your life better. How is the business making your life better? Do you have more free time? Is it income? Is it uh, being able to do what you want? Being able to take care of you know, your families? What is it? The things that are making your life better. And people usually uh, can come up with those pretty quick. Well, maybe not. But then on the right side, list three ways that the business is making your life worse. And if you really want to do something, take those two questions in this exercise back home to your spouse. <laughs> and ask them to do it also, without talking to them. And then compare it to yours. You may find very different answers there. How is this business making your life better? How is this business making your life worse? So, what do we want to do? If, we're, if someone's going to help you, if you're even going to help yourself, you would identify those things, let's create a focus. Let's figure out how we can build on that left side of the paper, and figure out how we can get rid of the right side of the paper. It's really pretty simple. You can have 200 page books on this theory and that theory and everything else, but the question is, if the only thing that's making your, the reason this business is here is to make your life better, how is it making it better? How is it making it worse? How do we get rid of this? How do we build on that? That is our approach where we start with everything. So, all of you want success. Anybody here not want success? No hands go up real quick, okay? What is success? Success is achieving your goals. But we have to turn it back around. What's failure? Failure is not achieving your goals. It cannot be acceptable to you not to achieve your goals. How do we get around that? We don't write them down. If we don't write them down, we can always kid ourselves about what our goals were, right? Very simple, okay? You know, you can kid yourself all for the next 20 years and then figure out how you're going to retire because you won't have any money. Or you can lay it out and say, this is what I'm planning on doing. And maybe, again, this is something you ought to talk to your spouse about. <laughs> Just uh, uh, what are the goals? A strategic plan defines how you're going to do, achieve those goals. It focuses you on your defined success. And financially, this is an important thing in here. Financially, the only real way to achieve success is li liquidity produced through the consistent production of profit. 
A lot of big words there, but that is how you will achieve your success. It's liquidity through the consistent production of profit. And in order to achieve that, you have to produce a positive cash flow, enough to have significant and, su and su uh, sufficient liquid assets so that all of your responsibilities can be met when due. Now you can make decisions based upon profitability rather than upon cash flow. I'm going to throw a quick personal story in here. When I was about 27 years old, I moved to Denver, and uh, maybe I'll say this to make me younger, okay? And uh, I, I uh, bought 17 acres of land, built four lighted softball fields in a bar. And we were totally undercapitalized. We didn't have enough money. And there were two kinds of softballs that you could buy. One were red dots, one were Dudleys. They were both approved. And you buy a lot of softballs when you're playing four fields, five games a night, seven days a week, boom, 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 it's a lot of balls. The red dots were I, I don't remember, but they were, say, $25 a dozen. The Dudleys were $28 a dozen. So which ones did I buy? $28. Yes, the $28 a dozen ones, because they gave me terms. Because I didn't have sufficient cash flow to make proper profitability decisions rather than making cash flow decisions. And that's why a large part of your success has to have a component of retaining enough cash so that you have the liquidity so that you can meet all of your responsibilities. It is hot in here too, isn't it? I agree. So, and so what tools do you need to focus yourself on that success? So let's take a look at some of the big picture things and uh, let's start with this. What would your business look like if we're going to do a strategic plan? This is what your plan is. What would your business look like if you built on the things that you are making your life better? and you got rid of the things that are making your life worse. What would it look like? What would your sales volume be? What would your gross net profits be? How do you have to change your operations to achieve those levels? Uh, how, much, how would you have to change the way your company communicates internally because you're going to have more staff now or whatever it is? Uh, what new assets are you going to have to purchase? What staff is going to be required? Those are the kinds of questions that you have to ask in an overall strategic plan. And why do we want to write down? So you can hold yourself accountable. Has anyone ever walked into your office and said, hey Brent, great job last month. Uh, you know, you held your uh, overhead to 22%. <laughs> Nobody does that, right? You never get positive feedback. But that also means you're never getting negative feedback. Brent, why did you let your, your uh, overhead get to 27% last month? No one ever asks that question either, unless you can ask it of yourself. And that's why you write these things down, you put it together, and you uh, constantly ask those questions. They are a means to your ends by putting those together. And you don't just ask those once. That's something that is a constantly reevaluated process that you have to train yourself to do monthly, relook at. Where are we trying to go? Are we on track? What are we going to handle that? You actually need to set aside. I don't know, half an hour a month to look at your financial statement, to look and say, are we on the track to do this? Are we getting the information we need? If you know, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. You're not going to win every month. That's okay. But if you know where you're supposed to go, you can change it. So a strategic plan has to accomplish have those objectives. It has to have a component of a financial plan, operational plan, communications plan, sales plan. Those are all the components that would go into it. So here's a good one. How would you explain to your spouse how you plan to run your business in order to achieve both your goals and their goals? And precisely how are you going to do it? That's your strategic plan. Anybody think that's a bad idea? Well, maybe for some businesses it would be a real bad idea right now. But uh, uh, we need to turn that around so it's not. So that you can look at it and, and say, this is how we're going to do it. This is what we have to do. So we'll move from there now to your six responsibilities. There are six responsibilities that the business owner has that they have to accomplish in order to achieve their financial plan. That is, first of all, you have to make a minimum mandatory percentage of profit. Secondly, you have to create cost controls to tie back to that minimum mandatory percentage of profit. You need to create an organizational structure that enforces the cost controls. You have to sell internally and externally. 
I mean, well, you've got to make sales outside, but you also have to sell your employees on why they should be enforcing the cost of that. You have to keep the money you make, and you have to have fun. If it isn't fun, you aren't going to do it. So, let's take a look at those six things. Your first responsibility is to earn a minimum mandatory percentage of profit. A lot of you don't even, I shouldn't say that, I'm sure this group all knows what it is, but many of the business owners that I have met with, they don't even know what that minimum mandatory percentage of profit is that they're supposed to be making. And they don't get reports back to show whether they're on track to do it. And they aren't monitoring, they aren't making the changes and adjustments to actually reach it. And when we say the minimum mandatory percentage of profit, don't tell me you just made 20% when you didn't pay yourself. All of your costs and your proper accounting has to be laid in there so you know that you have profit that's adequate to retain cash, to buy new assets, to pay your taxes, and reduce your debt. Those are the four things you do with profit. So you need to first identify with someone, if you can't do it yourself, what is that minimum mandatory percentage of profit? And are you really trying to make money? That's an insulting statement, I know. But I go into so many businesses that are trying to do so many things other than make money. I'm trying to get their payroll out. I'm trying to deal with this employee problem. I'm trying to get uh, uh, some money collected. I'm trying to, to uh, uh, hire somebody for this position. I'm trying to do that. You guys are really good or you wouldn't be here. You will do whatever it is you're trying to do. But you have to create a focus within your organization that's trying to make money. How do you try to make money? You have to have a plan to do it. You have to get reports back to see if you're on track. And then you have to make adjustments as you go along. This is your job. You have really, your job is to run the company and make a minimum mandatory percentage of profit. It's not to be nice to your employees or whatever it might be. Uh, it's to make money. You will be able to do it if, because you are good if you have the tools to do so. Once you have your strategic plan in place, you have to focus the entire company on making money. It doesn't have to be crass. You don't have to try and beat them over the head with it. But they need to understand what their responsibility is so that, and what their role is in producing that minimum mandatory percentage of profit. And so think about right now. Do you have, can you say that every person in your organization is currently focused on what their role is to produce that minimum mandatory percentage of profit? The people that you had say no to, you need to readjust. Your second responsibility is to create cost controls. The basic cost control tools that every company needs and has to work with are a budget and a cash flow forecast. They are two different things. Your budget lays out and determines how, you know, what profits you're going to have. Your cash flow determines when you will be able to spend it. They're, they're separate. I was told once, I can't say I've ever verified it, but uh, I was told once that uh, over half the business bankruptcies that take place, one of the uh, debts in there is to the IRS on the profit they made on the year they went out of business. Because it was the cash flow that led them there, not necessarily the profitability. So if you don't have a budget that is lays, lays out your financial map as to how you're going to produce that minimum mandatory profit, and you don't have a cash flow forecast that looks at least six weeks forward so that you know that you just, you know, you don't spend money just because you have it. Uh, you're going, you have the risk of running, you're putting your business at risk is what you are doing. Let's we'll start with a budget. What is a budget? Oh, I can't go out to lunch today because I'm on a budget. No, that's not what a budget is. A budget is a financial plan that is designed to produce a desired predetermined result. Anybody think they shouldn't have that? A financial plan designed to produce a desired predetermined result. What do we have to plan for? Everybody has to plan for revenue, cost of goods, overhead. What is your job to produce that minimum mandatory percentage of profit? It's very simple. Two numbers. And in this little example, it will be 60 and 30. If you can maintain your cost of goods at 60%, you can maintain your overhead at 30%, you will produce 
if this is what you wanted, uh, a desired net 10% profit. Pretty simple. But your job is to hit those two numbers. So how do you focus yourself on those two numbers? How, there's what we call KPI, Key Profit Indicators. How do you focus yourself to know that you are hitting 60% in this example of cost of goods sold? How often do you have to see it? How often do we have to look at it? How do we tie that into our pricing and our bids? How do we know that we're hitting that 60%? And what can we afford? That's the overhead. That's 30%. If the cost of goods is going up, what do we have to do? We've got to lower the overhead. How are you going to know to do that if you aren't monitoring constantly? Uh, I use a quick example here. Uh, two guys are walking, you've got Starbucks all over this place, okay? Two guys walk by the, the Starbucks. First guy's, first one's a homeless guy. Actually, second one's a homeless guy. First guy's a homeless guy. And he looks in and he sees that $4 cup of coffee. And he goes, boy, I sure want that $4 cup of coffee. But I don't need it. And he walks on by. And then comes the suburban housewife with lots of money in her purse and lots of money in her checkbook. And she sees that $4 cup of coffee and says, I need that $4 cup of coffee. And so she goes and buys it. You can't run your business from wants and needs because the only difference between a want and a need is the balance of your checkbook. It's what is required for the business. What fits into your financial plan? What can we afford? In this case, we can afford 30% of whatever our revenue is to be our overhead. That's all. It's not rocket scientist work, okay? But if you want something and you just happen to get a big check in, you're just going to spend it. And what's going to happen next month? Your toast. Okay, anytime. Ta-da, there we go. Oh, now i got to go back. That's good. The third responsibility is to create an organizational structure which will enforce the cost controls. What do I mean by that? What is an organizational structure? It's your people. What are their jobs? Their job is to enforce the cost controls. Think about that. Say you've got somebody that's, uh, I don't know, a manager or whatever, responsible for your bidding or whatever. His response or her responsibility is to hit 60%. Is he doing it or isn't he doing it? And how do you find out if he's doing it? Do you look it up yourself and you hunt it down in the middle of the night to decide? No. Their responsibility is to tell you every week whether they've hit it or not. And I like to say, tell me on Friday afternoon. Because if you didn't hit it, at 7 a.m., we have a meeting on Monday. And you have to tell me why you didn't hit it and how you're going to change it. But if you hit it, no meeting. But that becomes part of their job. Uh, same thing, you can have a person in the office and so on. What do you think you own? What do you own? What, is, what does your business actually own? Let's, let's think about that a little bit. You don't own the people. Most of you don't even own the assets, a bank owns those, okay? What you own is a system. It's a system that takes market demand for your product and turns it into cash. That's what your business is. It's a system. It takes market demand for your product and turns it into cash. Now, what's everything in between? Those are all of the tasks that have to be completed in order to go from that market demand into cash. So you can actually identify it in a quantitative analysis of functionality. You lay out what are all of the tasks that have to be completed. And so in organizational structure, then you take your people and you match those people to the tasks. The failure of many business owners is, do it, is they fail to do that. Instead, they hire Good people. David hired a good person. And I'm a good person, so he hired me. And I come in and I think, okay, I know what to do. I'm a good person. David hired me. So I'm going to do this and this and this. And other people say, okay, I know what to do. I'm going to do this and this and this. And they create their own organizational structure. And you have abdicated your responsibility as a business owner in creating that organizational structure. And so what ends up happening is you will have gaps or duplication. Some tasks would go unchosen, and some tasks would be duplicated, where more than one person chooses it. 
The tasks have to be defined, though, in terms of a result. You don't write out a job description and say, here's the 10 things I want you to do. No, what are the 10 results I'm expecting you to produce? That's what a job description is. The typical job descriptions that people have, they lift out all the tasks, that's a training manual. That's how they're supposed to do, to produce the results that you have identified. And if you have gaps in your system, what does that mean? You can't go from here to here if something's going undone. So, Andy, who has to do it? The owner. And you know why no one chose to do that task? Because it was a crappy task. <laughs> Nobody wants to do it. And so you come in there as a business owner, and every day you go, God darn it, i got to do that again? I gotta, why am I the one that's doing this all the time? It's because you didn't do your job to begin with. You didn't identify what had to, who had to do what. And you didn't assign it to them, and you're not holding them accountable for the result. Or you can have duplication, where more than one employee, Brent and Andy, have chosen to do one of the tasks. So what do they do? Hey, Dick, Andy shouldn't be doing that. I want to do that. Oh, Andy's going, to, well, you know, we've got to get rid of Brent. He's always doing what I want to do. You know, morale issues fly in. And it's just a waste of time, and it creates inefficiencies. And again, it was your fault for not properly identifying who's responsible for what. Gaps are unassigned tasks. Duplication of tasks are chosen by, by more than one person. And we, on most every subject and topic we've done here, we have an entire separate workshop we can do on it, but you're not going to get that today. Accountability. How do you hold your people accountable? This is something that, it's, it's so easy if you have to find the contract that you have with your employees. Well, I don't have a contract with my employees, what are you talking about? No, you define what results they are expected to produce in exchange for their paycheck on Friday. Now you have a very objective means of holding someone accountable. Did they do it or didn't they? If they didn't do it, what do you do? You either retrain them or replace them. So, or you change the tasks. Give someone else the task and the accountability. As a sidelight, oftentimes I'll go into an organization, we've got this project, we've had five different project managers, every one of them's failed. <laughs> well, why do you think that is? It's, you, you hired each one of those people because you thought they were the best person you could find. And you put them in there. So either you're not training them right, or you've got a bad job there. People just can't do it. It's not a doable job. You need to split it apart. You need to change the responsibilities for it. But you can hold people accountable if you've defined the results that you have to have in exchange for their paycheck. and identify those results. And if you added up all of the results that you're expecting your employees, what do you get? You get your budget. So you really can't create and hold people accountable until you can define the results you're supposed to have, and those results have to match your budget. Very simple. If you need uh, a million dollars a year to break even, you wouldn't create uh, a quota for salespeople for 500000 Okay? But we do that all the time outside of sales. You stop and think about it. What about incentives? You can't have an, every company should have incentive plans. But they've got to be rationally based. And you can't have an, pay an incentive unless you know what you're already paying them for. Or you're paying them double. Who the heck wants to do that? Doesn't make any sense. But if they know what they're being paid to accomplish, and they accomplish more, there ought to be a way that you're sharing some of that for them if it is producing additional cash. And we can get into that already also. Um, so, just yes. an easy Go ahead. Um, I have an incentive bonus for my project leads and project manager, 4% um, of gross margin, on time, on or under budget, uh, on time, happy client. And nobody gets hurt. There's always four components, okay. always four components. I'll add that. 
<laughs> so that would suggest that I'm paying that you know they're they're paid a very respectful rate, uh, just you know to make on budget. Um, so my double paying in that sense. Probably, although I don't really want to dig into it deeper. But what if you if this is what you're expecting them to do, you're paying them for that. But if they produce more than that, if they beat your budget and produce a hundred dollars of additional profit, why not give them ten? You know, what that one for them and nine for me, yeah, it kinda works. All right. But only if they have produced additional profit and and that pro or an additional cash profit. There are also you can have non cash incentives also. Uh, you know, Susie's uh, uh, job is to have the coffee made every uh, morning, okay? Uh, well obviously if she does it and cleans up dice and does all this extra stuff. She's not producing additional cash. But you might want to incentivize that anyway. So you know what? You give her a parking spot. You know, you uh, recognize her in front of the group. You send her flowers sometime or whatever. I mean, there are non-cash incentives that you can do to incentivize non-cash performance. Make sure you're only paying cash incentives to incentivize additional profit and cash flow. Bad news though, if you expect to hold other people accountable, you've got to be accountable yourself. If you're going to create rules, if you're going to create structure, you have to follow it. If you do, and your main job is to hit two numbers and uh, uh, produce a minimum mandatory percentage of profit. You know what? If you're not doing that, you're not holding yourself accountable and people will figure that one out really fast. Your fourth responsibility is to sell. As a small business owner, so many people want, understand completely that there are, are own, uh, customers that want to deal with the owner. Okay? So you understand external selling and you're probably very good at that. But there's also internal selling. Every time you have a meeting, you are having a sales meeting. You are selling your employees on the benefit of why they should do their job to enforce the cost controls so that the budget is reached and the minimum mandatory percentage profit is produced. You have to sell them. I had this one really goofy guy that was, uh, that, when he, I don't know, like one of that sort of here. But at any rate, you know, you've got to uh, uh, recognize that uh, most of your people are just there for a paycheck. And that's okay. You couldn't do all your work. You couldn't get everything done if you didn't have those campers. Most of your profit's going to come from your climbers. Incentify them. Let them really take off. But sell people. Sell them constantly on why they can move up a little bit. Your communications plan with them should include three things. Just like the the analogy breaks down a little bit, but think about a football team. They get together at the start of the year and where the Seahawks would say, our goal this year is to win the Super Bowl. We're going to go this, we're going to do that, we're going to beat these teams, we're going to do this, we're going to blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's where we're trying to go. And once a year they get together and they talk about where they're trying to go. And then every week, what do they do? They put together a game plan. They put together a game plan for what we're going to do this week to accomplish it. And what do they do before every play? They may know what, everybody might know that on third and short, this is what they're going to run because they've covered that in their game plan, but they have a huddle to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And so your business should work the same way. There should be a daily huddle amongst people so that you're very clear about who's doing what and so on. I recommend that you get an egg timer and set it for five minutes and after five minutes everybody's mandatory leave so that you're not talking about things, you're not doing this or that. You're just saying, okay, hey, I'm going to be out of the office until 2 o'clock. Joe's going to take care of me until then. Uh, Susie, you're going to be running over here. Okay, that means you're not going to be able to get this stuff done until after 4. All right, does anybody, oh, you got to do that. Okay, we'll get this done today. Who's going out there with this? You got those tools? Okay, boom. All right, break. Let's go. That first thing in the morning. The other thing you can do with that is you can create a focus. Everybody has something that they want to focus the business on. So create a focus point once a week to re and create maybe a little incentive, a pizza party, whatever it might be. I don't care, some stupid little thing, whatever. It doesn't even have to be that big. Uh, so that you're focusing people on changing a, a small result, a small behavior each week. Then you step back and you have a weekly meeting or intermediate or whatever it might be that, uh, okay, here's you know, where we stand on our projects, what are we doing with this and that and so on. That's a little bit longer and you make sure it's all taken care of and so on. 
And then once a year you have a picnic or whatever, that, whatever you want to do with it. Your fifth responsibility is to keep the money that you make. And that means in most cases avoiding risk. One of the risks business has are lack of growth. If you are not growing, you are putting your business at risk. Why? Because 80% of your profit are produced by 20% of your people who are your climbers. And climbers need a ladder. And if you can't provide growth, they don't see opportunity here. So they go somewhere else, sometimes for less money because they see opportunity. And so we want to, you have to have growth to be a healthy business to be able to retain your best employees. You also need a truck plan. What's a truck plan? God, I forgot. What happens if I get hit by a truck? What happens if my, this person over here gets hit by a truck? What happens if that person gets hit by a truck? Do we have redundancy built into the operations? Do we have manuals laid out so we can put somebody else right in there that will know what has to be done, how this job is done, what has to happen? Think about a truck plan for every one of your key employees. Otherwise, you will have employees who can hold you hostage. Yeah, somebody's laughing back there. Some of your employees can hold you hostage. You can't let that happen. This is your company. Your company goes under, you lose your house. They go across the street, get a new job and a raise. You are responsible for the running of your company. You need to have an emergency plan. What if you went into hospital for three months? Who is going to take over? How would they have authorization? Have your board of directors approved a succession plan that puts uh, uh, Bill in charge of things until I get back? What authority would he have? Can he go to the bank and do things? What, what level of authority can he do? What can he do? You need to have an emergency plan of some kind laid out in case something happens to you. You know, well, I'm getting older, but maybe you guys aren't, but uh, you know, these things happen. They happen. So you need an emergency plan, but you should also have a succession plan. Where are we trying to go? Who's going to be taking over? Who, how do we want to train people to take over? Otherwise, uh, it won't help you any. You also need to look at your corporate legalities. Uh, are we complying? Do we have our, 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 our we've, we've registered with the state up to date? Are we keeping minutes? Do we have regular board meetings? Do we do those things? Why do you have to do all that stupid stuff? Anybody ever heard the term piercing the corporate veil? Okay. Yeah, you think you're protected as a corporation until you don't do those things. So do those things. This is part of your responsibility. You need tax avoidance strategies. Meet with a tax attorney once every couple of years or whatever to say, hey, do we have this thing structured that's the best way to handle this? I mean, are we avoiding taxes? What are our long-term plans? I want to give this to my son. And he's going to take over. OK, what are we going to do? Talk about that. And you also have to do planned reinvestment. You have to, have to take some part of your money and put it back into the company so that you can be properly capitalized. If you sit down with an investment advisor, what are they going to do? They're going to say, hey, you know, take 5% of your income and put it under this and stuff and I'll invest it for you and we'll build up and then you'll be a millionaire when you're 30. Okay. Well, maybe you'll be 40. But whatever. Um, you've got to do the same thing for your business. You know, think about it. If your company's doing a million dollars a year and you put 2% of it away every year, would that really make any difference in how you run the business? What's 2% of a million, somebody? I'm not good at math. Anybody? $20,000, okay? You do that for 15 years, what do you got? Well, probably even double, probably even higher than You probably have over half a million bucks. How many of your companies would run business if you had a half million dollar cushion? How many of them would run better? Almost all of them, right? How do you do it? There's only two ways you, you uh, if you look on your balance sheet, you'll see as, uh, assets. And the first one is cash. How do you, if you, and it looks like any other, like a truck or anything else, how do you buy that asset? Well, either you pay cash for it or you finance it. So if you want to just take a half million dollars and put it in your cash, fine, go ahead. Or you can finance it and put 2% every year into it, and you end up with the same thing. But you, if, you know, if you're not planning like that, where are you going to get? What is the real success that you're trying to achieve? What would your spouse think about all that? Um, have you been, and then, you know, are you properly capitalized? Oh, we'll get past that. Uh, the only long-term means of proper capitalization, though, without selling part of your business, is to earn and retain profit. That's the only way you can do it. So do you have a plan for that? Do you have somebody that once, once a month calls you up and says, hey, how are we doing on this? 
Your sixth responsibility is to have fun. You know, so many people I, I meet, they're not having fun anymore. Why aren't they having fun? Stress, money, time, not enough time with their family, they don't have outside interests, security. That's what you're here for. That's why you should do it. That should be the one side of your, this is how my business is making my life better. So how can we build on it? You quit yawning. Come on now. Jeez. Hey, you make me yawn. If I yawn and I'm on tape, what is that going to do? Come on. I know it's 4 o'clock, but I haven't even got the five-minute warning yet. Jeez. Come on. I'm actually an accountant. I, I think this is more interesting than probably the rest of the room. So. Oh, well, you just know it all already. Come on up here. You can make this presentation. No, no, no. So, at any rate, we have success partners. Success partners are all old farts like me that uh, are around the company. Uh, one of them that's not an old fart is a very brilliant guy sitting over here uh, and happens to be from Oregon. And uh, we, we sit down with you and put it together. We give you a discount on uh, doing anything for having been here today. I'm going to wrap up and take questions because, frankly, I don't want you to say, man, that guy just drove on forever. I can't believe how long he talked. I was actually yawning and falling asleep out there. <laughs> uh, so, again, we're a nonprofit organization. We have a model. You only have what you give. It's by giving to yourself that you grow rich. Anybody know who Isabella Lendy is? That's where it came from. I didn't make it up. But uh, uh, that's what I believe. And that is how I insist that all of our success partners deal with all of our clients. How can we give to them? Because by giving to them is how we grow rich. Is it always monetarily? No, it's not. But that's not always what we are in it for either. So uh, we're on Patreon, uh, Mining My Own Business. You can buy on Amazon. I think it's a 2,947,000 bestseller. Uh, <laughs> you, can give me a call. Uh, you can schedule an initial consultation. This is me. Uh, I guess that's about it, guys. Questions? Yes, sir. For your programs, um, are they in a logical order, or uh, could uh, any of us uh, inquire and maybe uh, arrange to attend, or um, are they on? Are any two businesses the same? Pardon me? Are any two businesses the same? No. No. Matter of fact, I'm going to bet that if we really tied you all down, you knew. 80 to 90 percent of everything I just said. Okay, but there was that 5 or 10 percent, or maybe thinking about things differently and putting it in a whole concept that comes uh, together that, that can be of benefit to you. And so the first thing we, that, uh, to do you properly, the first thing that has to be done is you have to sit down and say, okay, what are your goals? Where are you? Where are your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? And then let's figure out how we can tie something together. Sometimes projects are very short, and then it turns into a, uh, a once-a-week phone call to follow up. Sometimes they're very intensive, and a person sits there with you for a month. I mean, it, it, it can depend on where you are. There is a progression, though. If you don't have the financial controls in place, you can't then create the organizational structure to enforce them. And if you don't have those, you're, you're not going to produce. So you do have to kind of look at a sequential way of addressing things, but some people already have everything all up front already, and it's just great, so boom, you can go right into that. Or not, uh, it just depends, it depends. Uh, on the website will be this presentation. Uh, on the website, we have over 200 different articles on small business management. Um, we are also starting up a uh, Patreon site uh, where uh, uh, additional workshops and stuff will be put on. Um, and frankly, call me anytime you darn well please. I, be, I like talking to people. I'm, I, guess, I guess I'm more yellow than I thought, right? Okay. And uh, I, I want to help. We're not from the government. We're here to help. <laughs> and, and, and really do take that approach. I can't tell you how many people uh, that will just call me. That, I mean, I've dealt with almost, almost 5,000 small businesses over the last 25 years. And uh, it's been a real joy. I've enjoyed it very much. I'm passionate about what we do. And uh, call me. We'll talk. Somebody. Come on, come on. Yes? Well, so my burning question was when you were talking about how we have to give our employees accountability, specific goals, accountability, do we do that with our business partners as well? 
Certainly. Like I said, accountability starts at the top. If you have partners, it, that's where it has to start. If you're not holding each other accountable, very unlikely that you're going to be able to have it filter down into the organization. And that's a large, I, a large number of the uh, clients that I've worked with, it's that same, that exact thing. It, it's, it's partner disputes, and most of the time, the partners are husband and wife which adds a whole other dynamic, dynamic to it. Uh, and so you do partial marriage counseling and partial uh, uh, consulting. I mean, it's, uh, and, but it works if people understand, this is what my role is. This is what is expected of me. Once you put that down, okay, now you can have a discussion about it. But if we just make assumptions about it, you're in trouble. Anybody? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one more time. Uh, the sign in sheet is going through. Who has the sign in sheet? It's back there. Okay. Right if you didn't get your name on here, please make sure you do it before you leave so that we can give you credit for this. And uh, we're, we're finishing up a little bit early, so you've got some time between the next. Um, before the next session, and please stick around after everything's over for a happy hour. So we'll have a little fun there. Thank you again. Well, for what it's worth, I will not be around. I have a catch a plane.